This is the taxcaddy.com website, which you can, uh, if you go to, you can see a video and then see other information from the taxpayer's perspective about how it benefits them. When you send the taxpayer an invite, they actually can also see that video on the sign-up page. Uh, the, web, the website provides the same capabilities, so you'll notice here this is the web page relating to the same tax return I just showed you in the mobile app. There's that uh, document that I just took a picture of. So uh, you can use this on PCs or mobile phones or any, you know, any type of platform like that. And one other thing I'll show you before you can, you know, I'll, I'll let you ask one more question, Greg, but uh, one thing to make sure people know about first is if you go to our website and you want to learn more about Tax Caddy, I would just like to quickly show you how to do that. If you go to sureprep.com and you click on the down arrow here, you'll see this process wheel that has gather, prepare, review, deliver, and the products that relate to each part of the process. And when you click on the next button, it walks you through that process, you know, gather with Tax Caddy, and you click next, and it just takes you through that wheel showing you, um, you know, what are the benefits of each part. So uh, that's there if you want to see it. Okay. Um, another question about uh, e-signature. The question is, how would Tax Caddy's 8879 e-signature work for a joint return? What happens is that, uh, so in that case, it'll ask for a signature from both the taxpayer and the spouse. And there is a place in the, there's a CPA dashboard in Tax Caddy, you know, so uh, for the CPA. And you can track the status there. So, for instance, when you first send out the 8879, the status would be awaiting signatures. If the taxpayer signs first, the status would change to awaiting spouse signature. Or if the spouse signs first, the status changes to awaiting taxpayer signature. And then once the second person signs, then the status is signed. Okay. Um, can you go back to the registration page? The question is, if the accounts are portable, meaning that the taxpayer, you know, owns it and can, uh, you know, go to a, another CPA, uh, how do they assign you as the preparer? So can you just explain the process of the invitation getting sent out, the taxpayer creating their account, and then the connection request. Right. So um, there is uh, probably the best way to show this would be to go to the help system here in the the taxpayer page, and where I can show you some screenshots. Um, so you'll see here there's something about creating your account. And you get this type of uh, invite, and by the way, the text you can uh, customize, you can put your logo on it, and there's a sign up button. It takes you to the sign up page, as I already showed you. You go through, you, you know, put in a password, answer security questions, um, pretty standard process. And then when you log in, uh, let me go to the next step here. Connecting, no, no, go to connect. Uh, there yeah. we go. Yep. So then the first time you log in, you'll see what we call a connection request. And in this case, the firm name is BL. And it says BL would like to connect with it, it. It would be whatever your firm name is. Would like to connect with your account. And when you click to view the connection request, it says accepting this connection request allows BL to access your tax documents and communicate with you, etc. And you say the taxpayer says accept. So that's how they accept the connection request. Now they cannot accept a different connection request from a different CPA if they they can only be connected to one CPA at a time. So. If the taxpayer or a spouse at some point breaks that connection, they could then connect to a different CPA. Okay, and, and you mentioned uh, spouse, so maybe talk a little bit about uh, additional users, uh, a spouse or, you know, uh, some other additional yeah, user. Yeah, right. Right, so um, when uh, somebody, when you send this to your taxpayer to create their account, and there's, you know, I mentioned there's a little bit of a process of putting in your security questions and, and, 
and so on. You know, the, the same type of thing that people are used to in any type of online account. One of the steps there is add a spouse. And so, or they can say I don't have a spouse, or they can say skip this if maybe, you know, they don't want to bother with that right now. But you can add a spouse as part of your sign up, in which case the spouse will get an email asking them to go and create a password and security questions and stuff like that. Or if you don't do it right at that moment, you can always go ahead and later in your settings, go to additional user. You can add a spouse like you see right here. You can also, in addition to a spouse, you can add an other user. We've had people who want to put in like an assistant or a financial advisor or someone else that they want to give access to, and that's possible too. Uh, okay, can you go back to the Help Center? I, I just want to point something out. Um, the, the Help Center that, that Dave is showing here is obviously uh, taxpayer-facing. So this would be something that your clients would use to learn about Tax Caddy. Um, and from a support perspective, we actually support your client, your, the, the taxpayer. So. Uh, if, if you decide to use Tax Caddy and you invite your clients to create their account, you're not fielding, you know, how-to questions. Uh, we do that, so we support uh, the taxpayer. Um, Dave, do you want to talk a little bit about the, the cost, and then we'll uh, get to the last polling question? Sure. So uh, Tax Caddy has. Um, uh, a base fee of ten dollars, and that's only charged if your clients use it. Meaning that, let's say you have a hundred clients and you send out a hundred invites, there's no cost to that. Let's say that seventy of those clients create a tax caddy account. There's no cost to that, and then sixty of them end up uploading documents to you and signing documents and responding to your information requests. So 10 create an account, but then they don't do anything with it. So you only get charged on those 60, and so you get charged that $10 fee when someone starts to use their account for that tax year. There are two add-on fees. The one is if you get, if you use the e-file authorization feature here where we need to do the knowledge-based authentication, there's a charge of two and a half dollars per person. So two and a half for the taxpayer, two and a half for the spouse. So it could be five dollars if there's taxpayer and spouse. We have ourselves a cost on that. We have to pay for the knowledge-based authentication to a third party that we uh, use to get that knowledge-based authentication done. So that's why we charge for it. And if you already you know, are using some other type of solution, for e-file authorizations, then you and you didn't want to use the tax caddy, the one that's built into tax caddy, then you wouldn't get charged that. So once again, you only get charged that e-file authorization fee if you use that feature. And the other feature uh, that where there would be an add-on charge is this feature to be able to connect to your accounts. So I mentioned before the ability for someone to say, you know what, I use uh, Wells Fargo, so I'm going to put in my Wells Fargo credentials, or I, you know. Uh, uh, you know, use ADP, et cetera, so I can go ahead and put in my credentials there. And only in that case, uh, if someone connects their accounts, is there an additional $5 charge. It's not $5 per account, it's just $5 period. And uh, if someone, let's say, puts in their Bank of America credentials and they have three accounts there, it'll download the 1099s or 1098s for all three accounts, and you can actually connect up to 30 different accounts just for that one $5 charge, and it's a great convenience for your customer and also gets you perfectly, uh, you know, perfect image quality documents the day they come out, so it's uh, really worth it.